thank you very much, Dr. Liu, for the very kind introduction, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me. This is a real pleasure and honor to be uh, at Omtri in your center, uh, CCAT, and uh, and seeing all the wonderful work that you and your team and colleagues at the University of Michigan are doing in, in MCT and CCAT and, and uh, University of Michigan Transportation Institute. It was quite impressive uh, demos and uh, I, I'm really delighted that I could make it in person. Uh, I wanna thank all the audience. I know um, there are a large number of people who registered. Uh, hopefully this topic would be of interest to them. I have a lot of slides. I usually do this uh, just as a part of the habit of being a professor, <laughs> but also I may skip some because I know you will have the, the PowerPoint. So if anything that I skip, the material is available later. Uh, it, the topic is about autonomous and connected vehicle safety. Let me tell you first by why I'm not going over or review is not that I'm gonna go review accidents or cases uh, that are problematic with current autonomous vehicles because there's a lot under development and research currently. Just mostly drawing on my own background and, and the research that I've done in the past and trying to, to bring to perspective some of the issues of the vehicle safety that kind of led to autonomous driving currently. And then also introduce the significance of the of the problem. Are we good? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I start by g introducing the significance of the problem with some statistics, talk about the integrated um, approach to, to safety, which involves both crash worthiness and crash avoidance. Bring some examples from uh, my lab's past work and current work. There's obviously several numerous projects that I cannot uh, you know, present in one talk. So these are just an overview of a few areas. Uh, hopefully it will kind of uh, bring to perspective some of the challenges of, of safety challenges of autonomous vehicles as well as uh, connected vehicles. Then I also have a perspective on safety and mobility that I would like to share with with colleagues, especially in this town near Detroit, where there is a lot of presence of automotive industry. And uh, let me start by uh, introducing how significant the, the safety problem is. If the statistics show that about 38,000 people die in US alone in, uh, in recent year, in 2020, and the prior years were very similar. So every year we lose about 37, 38,000 people to uh, car fatalities, over two million injuries happen every year. The cost of just medical and lost work is 55 billion a year. If you do other estimation of the lost productivity, it could be uh, in the excess of 230 billion, uh, just in US alone. So each year, globally, 1.35 million die in roadways. That means each day about 3,700 people die. I came here yesterday and it's mind boggling to know that within the 24 hours that I, I flew here and spent time with my colleagues here up to this talk, 3,700 people died uh, during this very short period. So that, that is mind boggling. Uh, also the statistics show that half of these people or pedestrian motorcyclists or what we call vulnerable road users. The road traffic worldwide is the leading cause of death for young people from ages of five to 29, which is a major, major loss to society or, or, or just from, from, from a humanistic perspective, uh, all the cost and engineering aside. Uh, also, current trends show that by 2030, road traffic injuries will become the seventh leading cause of death globally. That is in advance of many other diseases competing with only other diseases that are killing people. So it is an enormous problem. United Nations has an ambitious target goal of reducing the number of death injuries from road traffics uh, by, by 50%, uh, by half. Uh, and then road traffic crashes cause 3% of the gross domestic product uh, of, of the countries. 93% of the countries, uh, fatalities that happen in the low and middle income countries, 
are, are approximately 60 percent of the uh, of the countries that have approximately 60 percent of the vehicles. So that that tells you that even the problem is even exacerbated in the low and middle income uh, uh, countries globally. And the cost is about 500. 18 billion globally, uh, which is uh, more than the cost of, uh, of what they get in terms of the development and, and support and assistance. So it is really a big problem, not just for developed countries, but also for uh, uh, growing uh, economies. If you put this in perspective, it's about two, uh, about a, a plane crash, one plane crash every two days. Now, if I told you you have a plane crash of 200 people dying every two days, but then you think twice before you ride an airplane, right? We all do. I think that if that statistics was there, then we would be all alarmed by not flying. But we all get into cars and start driving. So it's really the perspective uh, is different because we think we are in control of driving, whereas a lot of times, our own errors or other people's errors cause these fatalities and injuries. So the problem is significant. When you look at the number of, um, of uh, uh, death uh, per 100,000 population, the change from 2000 to 2016, you see the, there is a decline uh, in terms of the rate of death, a slight decline in terms of rate of death, but the total number has increased. Uh, this, not the same, this decline is not the same for all countries. So if you look at Europe and Americas uh, and then uh, Western Pacific, you see the lighter green uh, bar is lower, which is 2016 relative to 2013. But the other parts of the world especially Africa and others uh, have a higher bar. That means the situation has gotten worse. These are data from World Health Organization. So it is a serious problem. It's a growing problem. If we don't do much about it, then the problem will persist. And these this injuries and, and fatalities will continue to happen. The cost to society will be a lot. Now, the way we look from an engineering perspective at the, at the crash perspective uh, or the crash scenario, what happens during a crash, is several phases that lead to a crash. And then engineering can contribute to the safety of the vehicles at different uh, elements of, of these phases uh, when a crash happens. Obviously, uh, a lot of work needs to be done that has happened by passive safety uh, using crash worthiness design, optimum design of the vehicles, safety systems that are enacted uh, or activated during uh, as soon as a crash happens. So working on seat belts, on airbags, or just the structural um, energy absorption of the vehicles. And a lot of my work, early work, uh, at, at my previous position has been focused on this. But then you, you reach a plateau at that level that depending on economy of the vehicle, you can, uh, you can really reach a plateau of saving lives by improving crash worthiness. So you really have to see what other elements of, are there that you can contribute to. So pre-crash safety and preparing the seat and occupant and restraining uh, system before the crash happens because you have the sensors uh, could help contribute uh, significantly. Then you can have active safety systems which are more of a preventive measures before a crash happens so you avoid crashes altogether. And also you could have, uh, I'm sorry, you could have post um, crash uh, trauma care uh, through ITS and, and providing uh, the, the, the right care at the right time immediately after a crash happens. So you can contribute to safety if you have this big picture of all the different phases uh, and that, that are involved in, in, in a crash. So a lot of the work that I have done uh, in the past focused on the, the crash worthiness of the vehicle before I moved on to, uh, to active safety and, and then autonomous driving. These are examples of our early work in impact dynamics and mechanics. Mostly we focused a lot on finding out the mechanics of the impacts for the vehicles, created vehicle models, we were the largest, we had the largest library of, these are earlier, we had bigger final element models of the vehicle. Uh, every year we created one or two final element models and they were 
publicly available for all researchers in the world to focus on crash worthiness and, and create models that were validated by crash tests and then they're evaluated for different safety scenarios. So a lot of our work focused on occupant protection, uh, modeling dummies, modeling human parts uh, or body, uh, like lower extremities or chest or head injuries, to investigate injuries during crashes. So, so you could design or optimize the crash worthiness of the vehicles. But as I said, you will reach to a plateau at some point that you avoiding crashes makes a lot more sense that you have to design the vehicle so you will avoid crashes altogether. Now, the, currently there's a lot of quotation about 93%, 94% of the crashes are caused or, or either fatalities or crashes are caused by the human error. There has been an earlier uh, tri-level study by US DOT uh, earlier in, in 1990s that showed pretty much the same thing, that the definite factor of, of crashes were attributed 70% to humans and then 93% that were the probable cause of crashes were attributed to humans. Then environmental factors were a smaller factor and vehicle malfunction factors were even smaller. So my question usually in this talk to audience, which we don't have that kind of interactive audience in here, is where, you, where would you put your money or your investment if you want to invest in, in helping this situation? And I'll pause here, let you think a little, and then I'll give you the answer. The answer is obviously where the biggest contribution is on the human. So you have to work on technologies that you can help the human to avoid crashes, or you take over the control of the vehicle. And this is what exactly has been throughout the years, the advanced the active safety systems, and then advanced driver assistance systems, and then more, more recently what we, in layman's term, call driverless and autonomous vehicle, where, where according to SAE, we have to call it uh, automated uh, driving systems. Now everybody who is in this field is kind of familiar with different levels of automation, uh, and, and then this standard of SAE has been developed over the years and has been uh, improved over the years. Uh, I, I think there is a later version than, than this one as well, which kind of divides the, the levels of automation uh, from no automation, uh, which is the manual driving, uh, and, and then everything is controlled by the driver, uh, to you know, driver assistance, to partial driving, uh, and then all the way to full uh, level five, which is full uh, driving automation. And the, the responsibility of the, of the driver uh, uh, it reduces as you go to more aut automation. And then uh, obviously at the final levels of level four and level five, uh, the system takes over all the control of the vehicle. At level four, you have limited uh, operational uh, uh, you know, design uh, domain and then and level five, you have unlimited. So any situation, any uh, condition, the, the vehicle should be able to, to handle itself. Now, in order to do this, this is mostly for audience that uh, you know, may not be working in this area, you have to look at what is, I like the simplified models of driving. And what we're trying to do is, uh, is to, to replace the driver in these situations by, by a machine. So what do we do in, in terms of driving? We have a desired trajectory. We're trying to keep at the center of a lane and then execute the task of going right, left, change lanes, et cetera. During this time as a human driver is sensing, detecting, and deciding, and the decision goes into action that is either accelerate, maintain the speed, or steer the vehicle accordingly, or, or maintain the same steering. Depending on your vehicle dynamics, your response will direct the vehicle to go to some actual vehicle trajectory. And then during this time, we are constantly, both the vehicle and the driver interacting with the environment and the infrastructure. So what happens here, we have the segments that belong to the driver, we have segments that belong to the vehicle. And what we are trying to do is really help this to be integrated with this to have automated driving system. And in order to do this, we have to do these functions that the driver does. In my opinion, this part is easy uh, to a certain domain, not the, the entire domain. The control part is easier. Uh, and this part is where we are struggling. And then all the sensors and sensor fusion, all the work needs to be done in this area. So a lot of challenges remain in perception. Now, if you bring connectivity to this, then there is additional information that needs to be done. 
So from the sensor perspective, there are a host of sensors available out there from long range to short and low range uh, proximity detection sensors that will give you the distance between you and the objects ahead or around you. And then LIDAR and video camera, obviously video is, is one of the primary things that also need, uh, need to be incorporated. So this sensory capability is replacing the human sensory capability or augmenting it or actually improving it in certain cases. Now, from a control perspective, a simple control thing would be, you really look at it, you're, there are two states that you're trying to control. You're maintaining a velocity by either accelerating uh, or you um, keeping the, the same velocity, decelerating, braking, or you, you're keeping a, um, a steering angle. So ultimately the three things that uh, go input to the vehicle is a gas pedal, brake pedal, and a steering wheel. So when you're controlling the vehicle, you're really controlling these three items and you're replacing that. That's the input and then generates the, some actual vehicle speed and uh, actual steering. You go in a loop with sensors to make sure that this control system is perfectly working. And at the same time, at the higher level, you have a trip plan, uh, all other traffic stuff and rules. They go as an either ADAS or to the driver to take the control action. And at the environment, there were other things that you sense with your camera during the autonomous driving and replacing this. So this kind of uh, control diagram or semi-control diagram actually represents this whole process of, of autonomy. Now, if you delve into it a little bit more, uh, you need more items in this architecture besides that control diagram that I showed because there are benefits that you gain by having other sources of information. For example, you will have the map data, you will have a map of the entire road, you integrate that in that process. Uh, and that together with your uh, perception of the environment and localization uh, could lead to algorithms that would do the decision-making that the human does during the driving. And at the same time, you will have other things that are route selections or alternate uh, route selections that come into picture and that's part of the planning and they go to the controlling of the vehicle. Or you have other things that constantly needs to be done like estimation of the vehicle status itself. The driver state if you're doing is still a hands off of the control uh, and uh, whatever you need for human machine interface that has to do with what, uh, uh, how you represent the information data to the driver. So, uh, different people have different architecture for these, but all of them pretty much have the same kind of elements in them. I think we have a few too many arrows in this, <laughs> in this diagram, but the, the gist of it is that we have a collective of sensory information and external, internal from the vehicle and items from information, from communication, from other infrastructure of the vehicle. And they all go to some combination of deterministic algorithms and AI-based algorithms, and together they generate the, the desired trajectory that we need to, uh, to, to do the work safely. So if you were to uh, kind of enumerate these different technologies at the high level, uh, if we have, in my opinion, these features, then you're able to have autonomous and connected vehicles. One would be having the ability to know and estimate the state of the vehicle itself. You kind of self-diagnose the vehicle. I think it's very important to have this capability. We currently have that, but I think for autonomous driving, we need an enhanced version of what we currently have. Uh, situational awareness and estimation of our surrounding is all our sensory capabilities, video, radar, LIDAR, uh, or whatever other sensor combination that we can, we can afford for the economies of the future. We should have a global and local maps and information on the roads, roads and infrastructure that are enabled by either satellite, GPS, or our local sensing. Uh, another element is the wireless communication among vehicles or vehicles and infrastructure, which provide additional useful safety critical information to the vehicle. Knowledge and estimation of the driver state, because for the foreseeable future, we still have driver from level zero to level four or level three. We have driver in the loop and understanding the state of the driver during autonomy operation is very important. We should have a multi-level sensory and data fusion and situational awareness algorithm that will take into account not only what we are seeing, but also what we have seen in the past. So all the AIs and, 
and deep learning that people are exercising is another element. And the AI type decision making and reasoning is all obviously needed for executing our trips and our, our uh, safety critical uh, decisions that we make during uh, planning a trajectory and ex responding to external stimuli. Now interface with driver or generate warnings and alerts or take over automatic control is another feature that needs a lot of attention because we really don't know whether the driver is ready or not to take over the control. And that's the subject of research by itself. And then what I present a little bit of that today is the cooperative perception that means creating motion plans through communications by other vehicles, which is another feature that I think in the foreseeable future we will need for connected vehicles. Some of the work example of, uh, of the current work that my students and myself have been doing is working on really on sensors, on cooperative mobile robots that sense together, do trajectory following to, to have uh, platooning and things of that, of that character uh, for, for car following or trajectory following, cooperative perception, hierarchical control, and then things that happen during platooning for platooning, merging cooperative tasks. And in the second area or major area that I have a little bit of work on that is in neuroengineering is really f finding out fundamentally what happens to the driver during driving. Now, facial monitoring and, and face monitoring and eye monitoring have been around for a long time. Uh, we are also looking at the EEG and the brain signal uh, that we could, we could do things like a steady state visual evoked potentials and find out what, what is really happening in the, in the brain of the driver on different conditions and different scenarios. That will, gives us, uh, uh, that will give us a, a more deeper insight about drivers' physiological conditions as, as they drive. And that insight could help to, to enhance the, the design of the future ADAS. Now, to me, the tools that we need as engineers to do uh, autonomous and connected vehicle research are, are, are multi-level. One is obviously simulation, and simulation can take different categories from traffic simulation to individual vehicle simulation to vehicle dynamic simulation or connected vehicle simulation. And that's a lot of our thesis and dissertation are fundamentally start with that simulation. Then to be able to test some of these realistic scenarios, we develop a emulated traffic environment laboratory where we have small robotic uh, platform that, that mimic an autonomous vehicle. So they're pretty much equipped with everything that an autonomous vehicle is equipped with, but at a smaller scale with lower beam uh, in a laboratory environment. They have GPS, they have their own CPU, they have a camera, they have infrared, they have IMU, and they can do pretty much everything that a large car can do. But it allows the students to test and proof of concept of the algorithms that we develop. Uh, next stage is we have a driving simulator in here. I intentionally have this picture in here where you have a desktop and a, and a full vehicle because this is a driving simulator that allows you to have connected vehicle simulation. So the two simulators are connected with each other and they allow uh, people drive in the same scenario. Now if money and space is no object, this is expandable to multiple vehicles. So you can have 10, 15 vehicles with 10, 15 drivers driving the same thing, or you can have traffic scenario that, that generates uh, traffic in an autonomous environment. And then we have the capabilities of monitoring the eye and the brain wave and other physiological sensing. Uh, recently we have also developed our in-house um, autonomous car, which some of the things that we have tested on mobile robots, we are hoping to be able to test on the real autonomous car. Obviously, we want to use everything for training students, so we, have, we are part of an auto drive team, which is a, a Chevy Volt uh, autonomous car student competition. This is an undergraduate competition that we are part of, and uh, I think our team won some accolades the previous years, third place, fourth place on, on that competition. They continue to do that this year as well. Now, one of the areas that I worked on is really on uh, cooperation between mobile robots or vehicles for either formation of the platoons or following the trajectory following of the cars uh, following each other. So we did a lot of simulation about uh, the, the platoon formation 
uh, when there is noise, when there is sensor failure, uh, how do you use the cloud and to communicate the vehicles with each other to create the gap and then fit in into the platoon. Obviously, we worked on the stability and all of that, so there's no time to go over all the, those details. But some more experimental work that we have done, um, I will present in the next few slides. Uh, these are, uh, the platoons are, are uh, obviously uh, a, a scenario where you have multiple vehicles following each other in a train-like scenario where they provide added efficiency, they provide added safety, and, and then for, for regular drivers they add uh, added comfort as well. So, uh, but to ensure safety you have to make sure that you have the right algorithms that Platoon actually operates the way it's intended. So that's why where we tested things that I'm going to show next. You have to have uh, some of the autonomous capabilities even in the laboratory segment. So we did autonomous driving in a lab. We have a lane detection method in-house developed, so where you do the image distortion, you create the edge detection, then you um, do the what we do, we call inverse perspective mapping, where we do the, the perspective into two dimension, and then on the two dimensional plots, we find the center of the lane, and then uh, we execute a, a pure pursuit algorithm to, to follow uh, the center of the lane. These are uh, mobile robots that you purchase uh, and we program in-house. We also developed our own uh, uh, RC converted vehicle that is another small mobile robot that is Ackerman steering. These are slow speed as you would see in the future uh, videos that I will show. But this, this other one that my students developed in the lab goes very fast. It go, can go up to 60 miles per hour. We cannot test it in the lab. We really test it outside in the lobby or on the parking lot. Then we use the, you know, the lane keeping and pure pursuit control for these robots to go at the, at the center of the lab. This is just a quick video of showing that this uh, little robot is capable of autonomously driving itself as long as the lane marking is there. Uh, so, for the cooperative vehicle following through communication, which is an added capability to adaptive cruise control, we call cooperative adaptive cruise control, where you have the benefit of communication among vehicles to improve the performance of the adaptive cruise control. Adaptive cruise control has been around and perfected. So we just wanted to see whether when there are failures, especially when you're doing platooning, safety becomes an issue. And you want to make sure that when your sensors are not working, your platoon continues to work. So that's why we undertook this, this project to, to demonstrate that things work. Uh, we have a basic system where you have communication between the vehicles, but you also have sensing capability. We use the acceleration of the lead vehicle as a feed forward controller, that feed forward controller goes through a filter, and with that we try to minimize the error between the desired gap and the actual gap. So there is a set gap that we put for, for platooning and want to main, uh, uh, make sure that that gap is maintained by minimizing this error. So through this uh, cooperative adaptive cruise control we tested with the robots and we have shown that the, the, ACC, the CACC, which is Cooperative Adaptive Cruise Control, really works better than regular adaptive cruise control. And uh, as these, uh, these lab tests are, are going on, they, they were tested at different speeds and they're all very functional. When you look at the ACC velocity, uh, you will see the lead vehicle uh, uh, velocity uh, and then the, the following velocities follow that in CACC is pretty much the same thing. But if you look at the gap, and this is the, uh, uh, the eight second gap that we, 0.8 second gap that we wanted to maintain between the two vehicles. Uh, this is the fluctuation with ACC. This is the fluctuation with CACC, which is a lot more improved. That basically this function that provides additional information from the vehicle front creates the improvement that, that we needed. So then we, tested actually different controllers for that, so I won't get to the details of that, but uh, pretty much all the controllers showed similar results, but the artificial potential function nonlinear control showed a better result of controlling the things. But this was mostly about the communication, uh, not the controller, but we did try different controller designs. 
Now, we also tested, uh, we're looking at situations where the sensor information fails. This is a safety issue. Uh, you could have snow, you could have situations where the sensor may fail or uh, it may not work. So we wanted to test and make sure that the communication will create a smooth car following. And we have tested that situation and it shows that, uh, again, uh, this is the gap function that shows that even with failure of the sensor, uh, between this communication information between these two vehicles, which appears here in this control diagram. This, uh, this system of the two vehicles tracking each other works using purely communication. Obviously, in, in real life, that would be DSRC or other communication protocols. In the lab, we had the inter-vehicular communication providing that function. Now, another, um, another extension of this uh, lack of sensor uh, or sensor failure uh, was tested where you have either the field of view is not there, your sensor information is not there, or if the sensor actually fails and you go back and forth between the sensor and the communication and make sure that you have a smooth car following when that situation happens. This paper actually won in, in last year or this year. Uh, it was last year paper, won us an SAE Vincent Bindex Award, where you, uh, you're, you're testing uh, your cooperative adaptive cruise control when your sensors don't work, but your communication is working. So uh, when you're going around the, you know, uh, the trajectory, you obviously have your localization results showing in triangles in here. Then you have your GPS receiver locations showing in a square. They're not necessarily on top of each other. And but your reality, in reality, you want to be real where the red dots are, where is the center of the lane. So we had the lead vehicle going through that, and then a follower vehicle following that lead vehicle. But under situations where you had both sensors, and did not have the sensors. So we wanted to show that this smooth trajectory following does actually uh, happen uh, properly as, as anticipated. So uh, this shows the trajectory of the lead uh, vehicle, the left uh, uh, diagram. This is the, actually the top view of the lab. And the right diagram shows the, the follower vehicle. So pretty much if you see it, you look at them, you see where the start point of this one is, the start point of this one is, and the end point of the two. So they pretty much follow each other. Uh, this is just a video of that where they start at the slower speed and then continue uh, to higher speed towards the end. Again, these are... Um, um, Proof of concept algorithms, which I think, uh, I believe they are extendable. You may need some additional calibration with uh, real size cards, uh, other noise or other filtering between the communication, but the, the work is really applicable to, to larger scale as well. And then they pick up the speed a little bit. And what is happening during these, uh, negotiating these curves and others, this, the sensors in the intervehicular sensor is not operational there. The communication is really picking up. So if you look at the data, uh, you would see that the, these two velocity profiles are really following each other. Uh, and then uh, this is where the, we actually did two different things. One was there was no range sensor used. This is a case where there is no range sensor. That means you're purely uh, doing the algorithms and communication. Uh, to follow each other. And the second case where we're we using switching between the range sensors and communication. So here you see where you have sensor information and you don't have it. You have the algorithm purely uh, operating on, on, the, on, uh, uh, on, the, on, on the internal vehicle algorithm as well as the communication data it's receiving. Then sensor picks up again and then it fails again and fails. So we tried on different intermittent sensor failure and sensor coming back, but integrating both of them together so you will have a smooth car following. So this, this shows that with these conditions of sensors available or not available but using communication and your internal calculations and audiometry, you can have in maintaining uh, the 0.8 seconds that we had in terms of uh, the error. So this green line is the error where you, you want to be and this fluctuation is the real life 
um, uh, fluctuations around that, but the video that as you said, you saw was corresponding to this situation. So this really shows that you can rely on communication, at least in the laboratory setting, to continue your connectivity and safety. Now, I want to shift to another project uh, very quickly. And this is the topic of cooperative perception. What, what I mean by that is turning every vehicle that has sensing capability to a sensor or a sensory platform that can pass information to other vehicles. So in this case, for example, you would see the pedestrian, and this car does not see it. This passes information to this one, and this will avoid the pedestrian. So what's the necessary is, why is this necessary? Is because the field of view of all vehicles are blocked, or they're, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're obscured in several cases, in either intersections or cars being in front of you. Um, road geometry could be blocking. When you're merging, you could have uh, blockages. Uh, or you could have blockage by other traffic or obstacles that are uh, that appear, and that will blind your sensory view. Therefore, having other vehicles' information passing safety critical information to the ego vehicle would be very, very helpful. Now, for this, you would need a cross reference. We created, we uh, had tested and developed a framework that allows one vehicle to perceive with the aid of another vehicle and take the necessary action. So in order to do that, you have to have a relative positioning of these vehicles to each other because I have to know where the other vehicle information is coming from. And uh, there's a process for that, you, in, especially in the safety critical situations where maybe you're closer or more dynamic situations, you need to establish a relative pose to each other that shows your locations and orientation relative to the other robot or the vehicle. Uh, you have to detect and, and the objects in front of you, like this object or this object. Uh, and then you have to transmit the object position relative to your position and then perceive and respond to that. So uh, the ego vehicle will, will have to respond to the situation that, that, that comes to them uh, by the sensory information from other vehicles. And so these are the steps that will follow the car, uh, the ego vehicle, the white vehicle here has a field of view. This other vehicle coming from another uh, angle they have a, a feature in the road that they share with each other. Based on this common feature, they do triangulation. And based on this triangulation, you find the relative pose to, relative to each other. Uh, obviously, you can use the GPS as part of that, uh, that process. And then you, uh, this vehicle sees an obstacle, which, which is a, maybe a pedestrian or other vulnerable road user. This vehicle does not see it. This passes the information to this vehicle, therefore now it is in its field of view. Otherwise, it would not be in its field of view. So this, you can imagine several different scenarios of this that involves not only vehicle to vehicle, but also involves uh, vehicle to infrastructure, for example, at an intersection or T-section. So uh, whether you're, um, if one vehicle is, uh, has occlusion of, of the hazard or you're merging, uh, you're detecting, uh, your detection is failure, uh, failed, uh, you have hazardous lane change in this situation where uh, you want to change lane but you don't know what is, what is in front of you ahead of time. Uh, somebody breaks in front of you, you need to be aware. Or you're at an intersection where you don't see something that the, the vehicle in the other direction sees and passes the information. In all of this, is there, is, there are challenges in these because it looks very simple in the diagrams, but if you're doing this in real dynamic situation with vision system, there are limitations. You cannot have overlapping videos continuously at the real time. Uh, between multiple vehicles, uh, and then there's challenges in, in your positioning and, and understanding the hazard ahead. So there are a lot of intricacies that comes into picture when you start testing these things. We have tested on, a, again, robotic uh, platform, uh, and then on one has without the cooperative perception where two robots are, are seeing, and one is seeing an obstacle and does not have uh, the passing of information, so the second robot will actually will go over the object, or in this case, the pedestrian. It's kind of dramatic here, going over <laughs> the pedestrian. Whereas on the right-hand side, the vehicle passes information to the other vehicle, and it really stops at. So, um, 
this is what the view that you will see in the lab. And these blocks are really creating that uh, field of view where you can share and create the relative pose estimation. So one can see the other one uh, or know where, where the other one is with respect to your position. So I can uh, probably fast forward this or it should have shown that this basically shows where you, you come with the same scenario, but you really stop at the end. So I don't, yeah, this is, let me go back a little bit. So this video shows the same scenario as before. Imagine you had barriers that one vehicle cannot see the, the pedestrian. And then uh, the one that sees it is passing information to this one and this one stops. You know, it's, it's hard to see in here because there's no blockages and, and things. But in reality, this passing of information in, in real time, it happened in real time and, and worked. Uh, obviously, there are challenges in that that needs to be addressed. Uh, it is possible to do this in, in real life, uh, but needs one of the challenges and you need to have some common point to do to establish the relative pose. You can do that in the city environment is easy, but when the, in the playing field, it's harder. Although we're working on some techniques that we can do that using vision as well. Uh, we have to be selective in what to communicate because when the picture gets too cluttered, what part of that scenario you communicate to the other vehicle is important. Uh, the continuous pose updates and data transmission uh, required after obstacle detection is something that you need to continuously do that, monitor that between the two vehicles. And uh, rapidly dynamically changing scenarios become very problematic. So those are areas that need more attention. Now, the biggest challenge is when you have a scalability to multiple vehicles. So what we are trying to work with the PhD student to have a, a common algorithm that formally uh, shows uh, a, a method for addressing multiple vehicle information, which is very, very challenging. So if you look at the robotics and swarm robotics and all of that, yes, you can do some sensory information passing to each other, but in the traffic scenario for safety critical information, it becomes very, very difficult and very challenging. So that's an area, great area of research that we can work on. Now I wanna switch, and these were just two samples of the areas that we are working on. We really working on intersection, we're working on RRT and uh, we came up with a new probabilistic RRT method that allows two vehicles missing each other at intersection and, and working for intersection collision avoidance, but also autonomous driving at intersections. We're testing different algorithms, uh, op optimal algorithms for that purpose. Uh, we are working on different uh, anomaly detection and deep learning because those are the problems that happen when you have abnormal situations that you have not anticipated in the past or seen in the past. How do you detect that this situation has not been seen and your learning algorithm cannot handle that? So you need to know ahead of time. So if you have that capability, then you would be safer uh, by, uh, by having that learning algorithm know its own limits. So we are working on those kind of challenging problems which all have safety implications. So aside from that, I wanna to go to this other topic and we'll be very quick on this one as well. And this is about mobility. So the bottom line of this chart is that we're gonna have more and more vehicles on the road. So imagine not now, but 20 years, 30 years from now, when you have billions, hundreds of millions of more vehicles on the roads everywhere, Look at big cities like New York, Los Angeles, DC, uh, or international, you know, London or uh, Mumbai or others that have millions of people are all trying to travel where the transit system may not be as efficient as it is in some of the European cities. And we need to go to the first mile or last mile or go to the destination. How do we, how do we handle those situations? Does our current vehicle that we have can handle those situations? In my opinion, I think, in, in the entire transportation thing. And I have to be very careful when I say this in being in Detroit, but I, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I'll just dare to speak up and say that if you look at our transportation history, uh, we, have done, we have done things that I don't think from, from our perspective now makes sense. And I, I'll tell you what, we used to ride horses for our transportation. Then we, we improved that and put some, carriage behind it. We improved it in its quality and size. 
then we expanded and created the traffic, right? Very familiar, right? We, we, the same thing. Then we Model T came out or cars came out and then we made them better cars. And then we made them very powerful cars. And then we made them very slick and very fast, which nobody can actually is allowed to drive that fast. We made them bigger because we love our big cars and going to football and soccer games with family. And then we made them even bigger. So what we created was a monster of a transportation system that looks like what it is on the right-hand side, that large cars, even here, if you look at some of these vehicles, you see only there's one driver in this vehicle. There's only one driver in that vehicle. There's only one driver in this vehicle. So, and then we created, because of the power and speed and lack of uh, obedience uh, of the laws, these are the problems that we're seeing. Now, it's not all that bad because we also thought about hybrid vehicles, more recently electric vehicles, and the future would be electricity. So we have done some good. But in reality, if you look at the transportation system, I don't think we created an engineering marvel the way we claim uh, in our industry uh, because for an individual, to moving an individual, which is about 200 pounds, maybe another 150 pounds of luggage, uh, maximum 350 pounds. We created an engineering solution, which is about 3,000 pounds, or maybe a little less, but the majority was SUVs and utility vehicles a lot large, 200 plus horsepower. The capacity is two to seven, but the majority of the time we are just transporting this, which is said. So why are, we, why are we doing this on the right hand side to carry this? This is not efficient. I mean, as an engineer, we look at it, it's not efficient. So what happened throughout the years, what we did? So we created, invented the system of mobility that is exciting, it is fast transport, it's, it's good, it takes us to from point A to B, but we introduced several challenges, the few pictures before showed you those challenges. So we created traffic complexity and safety issues, and then we tried to fix it by traffic lights, regulations, the complex road system environment. We significantly increased the power of the vehicle and we continue to do that. We, are, we just have this appetite for more power and speed and then we creating death and injuries and trying to mitigate those. Uh, we've created serious environmental challenges. We're trying to do process design, recycling of materials, different manufacturing processes to improve that. We created excessive energy consumption. Uh, that's why we're trying to convert. Uh, and then we are trying to, again, mitigate that by optimizing design and materials, better power to weight ratios and alternative fuels, hybrid vehicles, et cetera, which is currently the trend. We have excessive use of steel and metals in, in our cars, and we're trying, again, to do alternate material solution, trying recycling to, to mitigate that problem. We have significant driver workload. Uh, now we are, we are in the autonomous and driver assistance era, which all the sensory technology is here to do. So fundamental challenge is that everything that we did, we created a patch solution for, and then continued and continued and continued. Now, the question is, really ask yourself, I'm asking all the audience that are online as well. If you were tasked to design a mobility system to take people in major metropolitan areas from home to work, is the vehicle that we have today is what you would design. I mean, my, my answer to that is no, this is not efficient. This, this up here is not efficient. This is not the system that we should have. I think the future of our mobility, especially in the cities, would be either ride sharing and then for more uh, personalized transit would be um, individual mobility vehicles. That means single transporter or double transporter that are smaller, that are electric, they are maybe autonomous, maybe not, or maybe you know autonomous capable that can take you from point A to point B and you can have ownership of it or you cannot have ownership of it. It would be like a transit or a taxi, automatic taxi that you get in and get out as needed and will get you to, to your destination. Uh, I think with the, with the infrastructure that we have in the US, the way we live and in the suburbs and need to go to, to the cities, a combination of that and the transit, improved transit system could be the solution or that system by itself could be the solution. In order to do that, you need to have this individual mobility vehicle. I had some of my students on different 
um, design projects work on these things. But there are some vehicles out there, and this is by no way, no means the commercial for those companies is just a few that my students and I found. I don't even know if these, these are all in business now or not, but this is a couple of years old. So Tweezy, for example, is one of them. Uh, it, is a, it is an individual single person vehicle and the characteristic of it is, is shown in here. The next few slides, I'll just skip through a few of them. Toyota High Road was another prototype. I don't know if they're making it or not. Uh, mechanical Solo was another one. A micro mobility, micro Lino was another one. Uh, and all of them have pretty much kind of similar kind of weight and power ratios. Unity was another one, right price thing. So if you compare them all together, you know, they're not all there, they're not ideal, but they do weigh a lot less than our regular car. And they have a lot less power because that much power is just not needed. So they are electric obviously, and, and there are some of them, and then they can get you from point A to point B. Now, if you look at the dimensions of these things, just, this is not to scale, this is just taking two or three of those, compare it to a, to a sedan, to a standard sedan, they're about half the length and almost half the width. So you automatically can double, if not quadruple the capacity of your highways if you go to these things. And they, they can both lengthwise and widthwise, they're, they're improved. So I think the future of mobility, people should consider this individual mobility transporters that are automatic, they're autonomous capable and maybe electric, they will get you from point A to point B and they go get charged and then serve the next person. And then there is a lot of effort in, in that by different faculty there, the different researchers. So uh, they will improve the capacity of the current road systems. They have a reduced energy consumption. They will have clean energy, obviously. And then we will have minimal environmental impact. And the safety can be, can be done through compatibility and making sure that the, the size of the vehicles that are in these scenarios in the inner cities or in urban areas or smart cities uh, are, uh, are, are compatible and then connectivity and uh, the kind of things that we said between connected vehicles, platooning or intersection control of the vehicles can ensure the safety of these things. So some general remarks for closing is that I think we need to focus on sustainable mobility solutions, connectivity and autonomy will be part of that, lightweight or electric vehicles, obviously, uh, as another part. Uniformity and compatibility would ensure the safety. Uh, I think combining ADAS and autonomy is expected for foreseeable future. I don't think we're gonna shift all of a sudden, wake up and everything will be autonomous vehicles. So there's a lot of problems where you have a mixed autonomous and manual driving and we need to address that for now as engineers. Uh, I think the majority of autonomy challenges are in perception and sensor fusions and critical decision-making. Control has actuation, has some challenges, but they're only, at the, I think their challenges are mostly at the extreme conditions uh, and unforeseen conditions that you need to have robust control and redundancy to make sure the control and safety is in place. Uh, I think both safety and traffic solutions will rely heavily on the connectivity. I think connectivity between the vehicles and the vehicles and the road users, other road users is very critical to, to, to the safety of the future. Uh, and then benefits are derived from the connectivity in this cooperative mode. So whether it's cooperative between vehicles or vehicle and infrastructure or vehicle and vulnerable road users, that connectivity will ensure the autonomous driving in the future would be safe. Uh, you know, the requirement would be integrated solutions, reliable, reliable emphasis on reliability and robustness of the algorithms that we develop. Thank you very much for your time. Sorry, I probably went a little bit over my allowed time. I apologize for that. But if uh, there are any questions, I would be try do my best to answer it. Do a little bit of uh, advertisement here. We have a handbook of intelligent vehicle that uh, was done in 2012 by Springer, but a lot of these technologies and controls are, are kind of discussed there. Obviously a lot has been accomplished since then. So many, many of our recent papers in the IEEE transactions and ITS or other similar transactions address these issues. I thank you for your attention and thank you for spending the time with me.
Thank you, Professor. Um, can I ask a question from here? Yeah, yeah it just make sure you project. Um, make sure what? Yeah, I just be live. Uh, okay. Um, so um, because I, I see there might be some questions from the audience as well, and if there's audience from the shootings I will see shortly. So, but otherwise, I, um, I I I do have a couple of questions related, but it's very interesting um, talk and a uh, question related to you know um, uh, portion of loss of sense, sensing capability and then uh, utilizing connectivity so uh, you know, so that you can uh, still. Um, have the proper trajectory uh, mm. for of the vehicle. Mm. Uh, did, did you test the internal? Uh, I, I see from your figure um, the the loss of sensing capability mostly is around in three to five seconds. Right. Yeah. And then how, how about the you know the, the, these intermediate? If you have uh, um, the loss of sensing capability a little longer does that? Consider? Right. Right. We we did. If you uh, I. Probably skip through them very fast. Uh, the the very first test that I showed was that you have no sensor capability. You're really looking at audiometry and communication to do the trajectory following. So whatever your desired trajectory is, you use your audiometry. And, but you need a map for in real life. You need a map for that. And then your audiometry and map uh, with proper communication can lead you to wherever traje whatever trajectory you want to take. Uh, obviously, in real life, there will be other challenges that is not in the laboratory. So we did test that. So in the long term, you can do that. There will be accumulated error eventually, which we need to overcome. Uh, the the sensor test was between communication and sensor failure. Now, if that if sensor failure continued, the communication will pursue and, and work. So as long as I had communication between the two vehicles, because I knew the trajectory of the lead vehicle, I could follow that trajectory. When that communication fails on top of the sensor failure, then I have to rely on the map and audiometry. Okay, so in that case, if I don't have map, now as long as there's two vehicles and communication between those two, I can do the trajectory following without a map. Okay, but if the communication also fails, that means I have two failures. I have the sensor failure, and I have communication failure. In real life, you stop the car. <laughs> in, in the lab, I think we can uh, we can do the audiometry and and the map using the map and then follow it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ruling down certainly on um, the reduction of the bandwidth and right. the spectrum. Right. Um, yeah. Can you discuss um, so, some of your view on the implication of these and uh, ongoing sort of uh, lawsuit related with the right. FCC ruling as well? Yeah, I mean, um, without going into too much detail, I, I think we need the bandwidth for safety and we need the bandwidth for mobility. So, any any shortcoming in that is gonna affect connectivity in the future. So if you wanna maintain connectivity, you need to have the right bandwidth and we hope that the FCC will, <laughs> will make the right decisions for that. Because without the connectivity, uh, I look at an autonomous or automated driving system as enhancing safety by itself, right? But that safety can be enormously enhanced if there is connectivity. Uh, it is improvement. This is still improvement over individual drivers taking over of the driving function but for an individual car. But reality is that to, to increase efficiency, to increase reduction of energy consumption, connectivity is needed. And in order to have connectivity, especially for safety critical thing, uh, functions, to safety critical tasks, we definitely need the bandwidth so whatever whatever decision the federal government makes, hopefully will be in line with providing the, the sufficient bandwidth for all, all different functions that you do. And that's very important for the current project and smart intersection. Right. All because we rely heavily on the connected, connectivity between infrastructure and vehicles. Right, right. Like infrastructure, you know, like certain places, infrastructure or centralized connectivity makes very much sense. I mean, very, it, 
at that intersection, if I have field of view in different directions, I can pass that safety critical information to the vehicles, then the vehicles can be autonomously driven through the intersection and the vulnerable road users could be warned or driven through that as well. So both manual and mixed can be significantly enhanced if you have the right bandwidth with, with centralized uh, intersection control. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll get over time, but it's not all right here. I want to thank uh, Professor Ascadari for taking time from his busy schedule to discuss his work um, and, and uh, addressing uh, vehicle safety issues. Um, and I want to tell the audience that if you miss any part of the presentation, um, the, the, the presentation video will be available on YouTube channel um, starting from Thursday. And, uh, um, and uh, please also, if you uh, like to uh, subscribe on the channel, you can click on the uh, chat box and subscribe on the YouTube channel. Um, and and uh, uh, you will also be able to be notified when the, when the video goes live. Right? And I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting. And thank you for all the audience that are on the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.